Welcome to Otter Creek Online. In just a few minutes, you're joining us virtually for our worship experience. But before we do that, we wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that some of you joining us each week online are longtime members of the Otter Creek family. And some of you are new to this online Otter Creek experience. You may even be watching from a different state today. We want you to know that our leadership team has a strong desire to know who you are. We want to know what you care about. We want to know what you're interested in spiritually. We want you to know that we want to know how we can help you grow. So here's what we want you to do very practically. If you're watching live through YouTube or Facebook, would you put something in the comment section telling us how we can reach out to you? We have a lot of ways of knowing metrics, but we don't know who you are in the online community. If you're not watching live, you're watching later in the week, would you send an email to our community life minister, james at ottercreek.org? He will get back with you. But our desire, just like with our Brentwood campus and our West End campus, our desire is to know who we're serving and how we can serve you better in the weeks to come. Thanks for joining us online, and we hope to hear from you soon. Good morning. Good morning, Otter Creek. Uh, we welcome you here on this Easter morning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And we are so thankful for your presence with us this morning. We're just thankful that you are here in this room. If it were not for the story that we celebrate today, the life and the death and the burial and the resurrection, the victorious resurrection of Jesus Christ, most of us in this room may not have reasons to be friends, to be neighbors, to gather together, definitely no reason to call ourselves a church family. But uh, we are here today and we rejoice because there is a story that binds us all together. And we are so grateful that you chose to be with us today. Some of you may be here for the very first time and we are honored that you are, that you are here. Some of you may have been away and you're home for the first time in a while. Some of you may be regulars here, but, but whatever brought you here today, know that you are here because of the resurrection of Jesus. And that's a beautiful thing that binds us together. If this is your first time, we encourage you to scan the QR code on the pew in front of you and let us know that you're here. Um, we encourage you to make room for people as they might come in who maybe weren't as punctual as you are. Uh, and, and we can squeeze everybody in here this morning. It's already been a beautiful day here uh, with this church family and we're excited to continue to celebrate together today. Uh, we are a family growing to be like Jesus. That is the mission statement of our family here. So today we, we join with the church the world over as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. We are filled with gratitude and hope and joy in the story of Jesus. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Let's watch this video together as we begin our celebration. In the Gospel of Matthew, the close disciple of Jesus describes a wild scene. He says, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened and bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After Jesus' resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Every culture tells stories about life after death. Throughout human history, there have been retellings of ghosts and spirits and monsters. Stories of life after death can be found in the risen kings of Babylon, the eternal pharaohs in Egypt, the Qingxing in China, spirits living body to body in India, or like in Ghana where the spirits leave the dead bodies for living ones. Humans have always been in search of eternity. We crave the exploration of it. The beginning of Christianity is this. God raised Jesus from the dead in the dark and damp of a borrowed tomb on a crisp spring morning just outside Jerusalem. And the body God gave Jesus was like his previous body, but not exactly the same. He still bore the markings of crucifixion, but the wounds had become scars. He was completely healed. As we gather this Easter Sunday, the year of our Lord, 2024, we get to celebrate our belief that what God did for Jesus' body God will do for everybody. Lost with 
sing oh your grace so free washes over me you have made me a new now life begins with you it's your From my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom, be faithfully born. But he canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace. So displayed on a criminal's cross darkness rejoices though heaven had lost
standing for the reading of scripture this morning. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. 
Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying within the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. The other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. Come on, put your hands together. I was buried beneath my shame. You could carry that kind away. It was my tomb. Out of the 
this day. Come on. that this morning. Amen. Y'all can have a seat, please. Woo. Man, it is good to celebrate and to worship together. And I want to go ahead and ask those of you who are serving communion this morning, if you would go ahead and make your way to the back, to the tables as we prepare for this meal. Thank you for doing that. So every week at Otter Creek, we receive communion or the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper. And this is a very important, this is a crucial sacrament for us. And this is an open table. All, all that believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, we encourage you and we welcome you to participate in this meal. So I would like to go ahead and ask those who are serving, if you would go ahead and start passing the trays this morning, that would be great. And as you're handed the tray, take a cup and don't eat and drink just yet. Grab one cup, it's a double cup, there's bread on the bottom and juice on top and hang on to that. Here in a few minutes, we're gonna pray and eat and drink together as a family. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 26, it's written, while they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus tells his disciples to do this, share in this meal together, do this in remembrance of me. A few weeks ago, uh, one of our members, Wendy Frank, talked about the significance of the physical act of this meal. Jesus asks his disciples to remember him, but I believe that Jesus also wants them to not only remember him, but to experience him. And we can remember something, we can remember something by talking about it or meditating on it or even reciting a creed or singing a song, but how much more powerful is memory when all of the senses are involved, especially the sense of smell and taste? At that point, it becomes experiential. We experience the body of Christ by the breaking of bread. We touch and taste and chew and digest. We experience the blood of Christ that was poured out for the forgiveness of sins as we smell and drink and savor the flavor of the juice. And at the end of this text, Jesus says that he'll never drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when he drinks it new with them in his Father's kingdom. So I texted Josh, our lead minister here a couple of weeks ago and asked him about that particular statement. And this was my text, okay? I, I texted him, since Jesus preached that the kingdom of God is here and now, is Jesus saying that he'll drink again with his disciples after, right after the resurrection? He does physically appear to his friends as he travels with them on the road to Emmaus and he serves them breakfast on the beach after a fishing miracle? Or is Jesus saying that he won't share this meal with them until he sends the Holy Spirit to spread like fire like it did on the day of Pentecost? Or is he saying that he won't eat and drink with them until his final return when he comes to judge the living and the dead and restore creation and resurrect his children and bring about the new heavens and the new earth? Josh's response to this text that I was pretty proud of was just, yes, that's it. And I kept waiting for the dot, 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 like he's gonna unpack this really, and he just said, yes. But that's it. I think in other words, Jesus is here. Jesus is with us. He was with us then. He is with us now. 
and he is with us forever. So all who have come here, suffering loss, disappointment, and tragedy, experience the comfort of Jesus. All who have come here plagued by depression or anxiety, experience the peace of Jesus. All who have come here consumed by addiction or habitual sin, experience the forgiveness and the love of Jesus. And all who have come here haunted by doubt and fear, experience the hope of Jesus. So take the bread, go ahead and grab your bread. And let me pray, Jesus, we experience your presence through the breaking of bread. And as we eat to remember your body that was broken, but is now resurrected, we give you thanks. Amen. Let's eat. Now take the juice. Jesus, we experience your presence as we taste and drink this juice to remember your blood that was poured out with love for the forgiveness of sins for many. And we give you thanks. Amen. Let's drink.
name of Jesus over every heart and every mind cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus Jesus, all praise for his goodness, for his power, for his love. Amen. So have a seat, please. This is my third time to do this across two campuses, and, and we've just had three phenomenal uh, services, uh, and um, so excited to uh, celebrate this day with you. My name is Dave Morgan. I am a shepherd here. Uh, you'll see a slide in a moment with options for ways to give financially. I appreciate being part of this family of faith because of the many wonderful ministries that we support. And we are so thankful for your support. I also appreciate being part of this family of faith because of our approach to special occasions such as Easter and we, the, the approach with such purpose and intentionality. I grew up in a faith tradition that, that was very wary of special religious occasions. Uh, we had a complicated relationship with days like Christmas and Easter. We weren't sure we should fully embrace Christmas because of skepticism over the exact date of Jesus' birth and we weren't sure we should fully embrace Easter because, as I was told many times as a child, we are to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus all year long. While these were sincere questions and beliefs, I suspect that for some of us, there was an appeal in just being contrarian, being different. I've tried to leave that problematic part of my, in many other ways, positive and nurturing church tradition behind. But there's often function to be found even in otherwise dysfunctional things. And I do believe that it is a functional truth that we as Christians have the privilege of joining in and celebrating the resurrection of Jesus all year long as we live what Paul calls in Romans 6 the new life. A new life just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for joining us in that celebration today and your support and for your support of the mission of this church today and every day. This morning, we have the Michael Jordan of interpreters among us, so I am going to be on my very, very best behavior to stay within the line, <laughs> to stay within the lines. Uh, according to the Gospel of John, Mary Magdalene represents the first sunrise service. As I pulled in this morning, there was a large group gathered at the pavilion to celebrate as the sun's coming up the resurrection of Jesus. And I couldn't help but think about the small party that comprised the first sunrise service in the church's history. John says Mary Magdalene just wanted to be near the body of Jesus. The fact that Mary had followed someone who lost didn't bother her. She was not swayed by his defeat in the cross. The fact that he had been embarrassed, the fact that he had been abandoned by all his male disciples. Mary did not back down from the fact that she just wanted to be near her friend. 
So in John 20, when Mary is searching the body of Jesus, she's not thinking resurrection. She's not thinking theories of atonement and forgiveness. She's not thinking about the beautiful pastel colors that all of you are wearing this morning. She's thinking about her friend, and she just wants to be near him. There is something about Jesus for Mary that is kind, compelling, courageous, seeking justice, forgiveness, beauty, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, all the fruit of the Spirit that Paul will lay out for the church. That starts in Mary's recognition of how good of a person Jesus is. Jesus is the kind of person who people want to be around him more than he thinks about all the people he wants to be around. And when she gets there, she's not thinking resurrection. She's thinking they moved the body. They stole the body. How am I going to tell anybody that there's no body? Nobody's going to believe that there's no body. And so she goes to get Peter and John. And in the most obvious humble brag in the history of runners, which is saying something, John tells you three times he beat Peter to the tomb. You know, in his old age, Peter was so annoyed, like that guy, man, gets into the inner circle and he can't, you can't tell him anything, right? Peter goes in first and he witnesses the absence of a body, but he also witnesses that Jesus's clothes have been laid in organized fashion. Middle school boys, are you listening? Even in his resurrection, Jesus could clean up his room. Peter and John don't know what to make of the situation. They're confused. They're terrified, according to the Gospel of Mark. And so they leave to go back where they were staying, John says. And then Mary, like, peers back in again. And this time, Mary sees two angels, and they ask her a very simple question. Why are you crying? I just want to be near my friend. I know he was embarrassed. I know he was naked. I know they put three times in three languages above him, satirically stating this is the king. I just want to see my friend maybe one last time. And unbeknownst to Mary Magdalene, Jesus is standing behind her. Now, if you've read John's gospel from beginning to end in one sitting, you pick up on things that you don't if you just read it piecemeal. And one of the things you pick up on in John's gospel is, of course, it's Mary. Of course, it's Mary Magdalene. Of course, it's a woman, right? It's a woman who begins Jesus's public uh, ministry at the wedding in Cana. His mom is one of the wedding planners. She's embarrassed. They're running out of the good wine. The, The partakers of the participants, they have been drinking all the good stuff. They're feeling themselves, right? They're to that point where even the DJ is embarrassed for how they're dancing. And yet they've run out of the good wine and Jesus's mom is worried about her friend being embarrassed. So she goes to Jesus and says, Jesus, do something about it. And Jesus says, this isn't our business. It's not my time. And Jesus's mom ignores him and tells the servants, he'll tell you what to do. It's his mama that starts his public ministry. Of course, it's Mary Magdalene who's first to the tomb and first to preach the first Easter sermon. It's a woman unnamed who is Samaritan, not kosher, not orthodox theologically, who Jesus reveals himself to for the very first time in the Gospel of John at a well. She not only believes in Jesus, she goes and she tells other Samaritans about Jesus. They believe in Jesus and they start churches because of this church planter. So of course, it's not Peter, James, and John. They've all abandoned Jesus. The writers go out of their way in a culture in which a woman was not even allowed to testify. Oh, it was Mary Magdalene who was there first. And unbeknownst to her in that moment, Jesus is standing behind her, according to John. And it's not his body that reveals his presence. It's his voice. Did you know that there are some relational psychologists, marriage psychologists, who believe that the number one way to cure resentment between men and women is to teach men and women how to speak to each other kindly, meaning 
There is so much wrapped up in the voice that we don't understand. So, of course, when Jesus says Mary's name, she knows it's him. There are some people in your life, when they speak your name, it's like honey on top of a hot biscuit. And then there are other people who speak your name. Hello, Newman. And you just kind of cringe because it, doesn't, it just doesn't sound loving when they speak your name. That's what's going on in Jesus and Mary. They're good friends. They are close friends. They are trusted friends. It's his voice that reveals his presence. Don't hold on to me, Jesus says. Don't cling to me. In, in Matthew, the word is the same word for worship. Like, it's not time to worship me right now. I know I've been raised from the dead and I'm a big deal and people are going to speak my name and follow me all over the world. There's going to be almost 3 billion people on planet earth in 2,000 years, but this isn't the time to worship me right now, Mary. Go and tell the brothers. Go and tell them. So she preaches the second Easter sermon, not just the first. Now that night, it's the first day of the week. It's our Sunday, their Monday. Depending on how you count. It's the first day of the week. It's the evening. The sun is setting just as the sun had been rising when Mary first encountered the tomb. And Jesus goes to a locked room where all his disciples are hanging out. So imagine what that is like. They're afraid because they think they're going to be crucified too. That's what the empire does to people they can't stand. They kill you. That's what we do to our prophets. That's what we do to our martyrs. If we don't like your message, we get rid of you. And so they're afraid they're going to face the same fate. So it's Sunday evening of Easter Sunday. The University of Tennessee is just qualified for their first Final Four. Can I get a witness? They're feeling terrified. <laughs> But hopeful, the door is locked. Jesus, not a ghost or a hologram. Jesus moves in the room and the door is locked. And he speaks to them, their own personal private Pentecost party. He breathes the Holy Spirit over them. This is Pentecost for the apostles before Pentecost happens in Jerusalem. Twice, John says, Jesus breathes on them and says, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I'm sending you out into the world to be my agents of love and justice and reconciliation and truth and beauty and everything that I stood for in my life in the Sermon on the Mount. All the reasons the empire couldn't stand me. I am now sending you out into the world to represent God's mission. And it says, but not all the 12 were there. One of the twins, I think his name is Tom Thomas. He said, I, 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 there's always one skeptic in the room, right? I, I'm not sure. Uh, if, okay, maybe if you show me where the nails went through his wrist, if you show me the side where the spear pierced his own flesh, maybe then. And so a week after that first Easter Sunday, at the exact same time, John says, Jesus slips into that same room. Thomas is there this time, and Jesus doesn't come to him in condemnation, but in gentle spirit says, Thomas, you don't need a sermon. You need a body. Touch my body. It's me. I'm not a ghost or a hologram. One of the fascinating things that is happening right now in American culture is that we are fast approaching a significant decline in Christianity in the United States. And you might look around and think, really? This is too small a sample size to base whether you believe what I just said or not. This room is not the sample size. 90% of churches today are smaller than they were 10 years ago. 90% across every denomination. There are more Christians in Africa than there are in North America. A hundred years ago, if I would have told you that, you would have laughed me out of the room because a hundred years ago, two-thirds of all the Christians in the world lived in either the Euro Europe or the United States, what sociologists call the West. 
Fast forward 100 years later, at the turn of the 21st century, two-thirds of all Christians live outside of Europe and the United States, in Africa, in South America, in Indonesia, and in India. Africans are sending missionaries to plant churches in the United States. This is not the epicenter of Christianity. And if you think it is, your world is too small. Well, I don't like that preacher. Well, the story started in Israel. That's the Middle East. It was never ours to begin with. And so what's happening globally right now is also, I'm sorry, what's happening in Europe right now is also happening in the United States. Operation Andrew, in partnership with the Barna Group, recently did a study of Christianity in Nashville, and they came to this conclusion. Almost 80% of Nashvillians count themselves Christian. That's why those of you who are from California or other states, you moved here, what's the first people, first two things people ask you? Well, what do you do? Well, what's in your business? Well, this is the South. Everything's our business. Well, what do you do for a living? And where do you go to church? You think people ask that in Boston, in San Francisco? No, but here's what Operation Andrew discovered. Even though 80% of Nashvillians count themselves Christian, Less than 35% of Nashvillians are part of a regular church community. And this is the epicenter of the Bible Belt. Well, what do you think it's like in Tampa, in Chicago, in Des Moines, in Phoenix? We are experiencing a tectonic social shift in the way that Americans think about the Christian faith. And my posture is that we could complain about it. We can get off my lawn about it. We can be angry about it. Or we can do something about it. We can get busy with being so infatuated with the implications of the story of the resurrection that we are more compelled to live the life of Jesus regardless of the consequences and regardless of what people think that we can stand in a presence of Christ, in a real belief in Jesus that other people will naturally, organically, relationally be interested to say, hey, you're not like the other people that I work with. I haven't had a coach like you. I haven't had a music teacher like you. What is it about you? It's that you, like Mary Magdalene, just want to be as close to your friend as you possibly can. But when you walk out those doors this week, you're entering a city and a world that would far rather believe in nothing. When you die, that's it. I remember the first time I understood this, I was watching Wheel of Fortune. This guy was on a crazy run. Of course, I was with my grandmother. That's the only reason I was watching that show, right? And the guy hit the bankrupt thing. $14,500 goes to zero. The screen goes blank. You get nothing back. That's what a growing number of Americans believe. When you die, that's it. Go big because this is the only shot you get. If you read the literature of the new atheists like Christopher Hitchens, this is the kind of thing that, now it's much more complicated than that, but that's their conclusion. Other people come along and they say, well, we we don't believe in Christianity. We don't believe in the resurrection story anymore, but saying nothing, that goes a little too far. So we're on a search for an elixir. We're looking for the fountain of youth. Hundreds of millions of dollars are spent every year in the state of California in something called transhumanism. When the Human Genome Project became an amazing discovery by scientists in the West, transhumanists said, what if we could, at a molecular level, reverse aging? Can you imagine how much money could be made in that field? And so there are hundreds, if not thousands, of people all over the United States who believe that we will be able to reverse the aging process. Guys, I'm rooting for them. I've looked in the mirror. I I hope they find a way. (laughs) I'm skeptical. But that's what they're trying to do. In the absence of the resurrection narrative of Christianity, they're saying, well, we have to replace it with a story. And then other people come along and say, you're wasting your time. The only thing you can do in this life is to make a name for yourself. Get in as many Hall of Fames as you can. Have buildings named after you. Name scholarships after yourself. Make a mark. Leave a legacy. Why do we give our kids our favorite basketball and baseball cards? Why do we give our daughters our favorite things that our mothers gave us? Because we want to outlive our life. Easter is your annual reminder from the preacher 
that you are two generations away from being completely forgotten. Happy Easter, church. I don't know who the richest person in this room is, but in 20 years, no one will care. I don't know who the most Ivy League decorated, educated person in this room is. We've got some. In 20 years, no one will care. I don't care who has the most influential job in the state of Tennessee and people know you just by your first name. In 20 years, no one will care. And so the legacy story is appealing, but it is empty. There have been really smart people who have come before us, like Plato and Aristotle and Socrates, and they were asking the same questions that we ask. And you know, Plato wrote this little thing called the Fifth Republic, and he has this cave analogy. I'm sure some of you have it on one of your open tabs you just haven't gotten to yet on your laptop. And this is what he says. And by the way, he wrote some of the hymns that you grew up singing, and you don't even know it. This is what Plato said. He says, well, here's what's really happening in the world. Your body is inherently bad and temporary, but your soul, your soul is this invisible thing that is inherently good and eternal. So while the body is wasting away, the soul will live forever. Plato wrote your Aunt Ethel's favorite hymn. Some glad morning when this life is old. Don't be shy now. I fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I fly away. I fly away, oh glory. I fly away in the morning when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. A plus music, D minus theology. What? Every Easter I get an email about that. Plato wrote that song. That is not Jesus and that is not Paul. That song believes that the goal of human life is to get off planet earth, to escape this wretched world. And just as God is going to set the world on fire and destroy it, God rips you away one glad morning. That is not the Christian resurrection story. The Christian story is also embedded in the hymns that some of you learned as children This is my Father's world, and to my listening ear, all nature. Come on, sopranos. The music of the sphere. This is my Father's world. Come on, Sopranos. <laughs> oh, rocks and trees. That, now we're getting somewhere. I know of a man who was a mechanic his entire life. And it's just like some of you who work with your hands. Like when I'm around you, I'm like, man, it's good to know there's still real men in the world. Some days when my boys are like, what'd you do today? I'm like, well, I, I wrote this awesome essay. Yeah, but what did you do? Well, I, you know, I was just, it was just flowing off the fingertip. There was a guy in my grandparents' church named Tom, and I always liked being around Tom because he had the mechanic shirt he wore to church on Wednesday nights, because he, not because he was a hipster, but because he actually was a mechanic. Those hipsters wouldn't last a day with Tom in his shop. He had grease, the kind of grease that was so like soak stained on his fingers. He could scrub for an hour. He still wasn't going to get it out. You know the guy I'm talking about, like a real man. Tom had three boys. Tom was as, he was a good friend of my grandfather's. He had his, he was as devout in his faith as you could be. And he had what, what I would call a very simple faith. Beautiful, highly intelligent, but a very simple faith. He never went to college. But he worked six days a week so his boys could. 
His youngest son was the smartest of all three. That's the book of Genesis, by the way. Oliver's like, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. The youngest is the smartest often. And the youngest came to his dad after college, and he'd had philosophy of religion and deconstructionism and postmodern religious theory. And he said, Dad, I love you, but I don't think I'm a Jesus person anymore. All this resurrection business, it kind of sounds like a fairy tale if you really think about it. Like, when have you seen someone raised from the dead? Tom wisely chose to keep a close, intimate relationship with his youngest son, not interpreting his son's decision as a rejection of his relationship with his father, but as a son who was searching for God and searching for truth. The older two flourished in their faith. They did, they did not struggle, but the youngest That's why I always tell people who say, well, I don't struggle with my faith. Faith is a gift according to the Bible. If you don't struggle with your faith, God bless you. God gave you a gift. But some of us do struggle with it. Tom, in his mid-70s, learned that he had stage four colon cancer. And it wreaked havoc on his body. Near the end of his life, he was passionate about spending as much time with friends and family as he could, especially his three sons. And so when he moved into palliative hospice care, he requested that his son would, could fly and spend some, a few days with him. This was his way of telling his son, I know that it's getting near the end. If you've ever seen a friend or a brother or sister in which cancer has wreaked that kind of hell on them, you know the death that you see it when it's on their body. You just see it. The skin changes. We've seen it a hundred times in the life of this church. So the son had not seen his father in some time and came into the hospice room and was to realize that his father was finite, mortal. Five pages of thick, long, legal, yellow pad paper folded like men do in a clumsy way, shoved into the envelope. They spent a couple of days together. They recounted all their trips and all their stories and all their sporting events and all the things that can bond a father to his son. And when it was time for the son to go home to be with his own family, before he drove to the airport, the mechanic, Tom, said to his son, I I wrote you this letter, and at some point I want you to read this letter. In his own simple way, in a mechanic's voice, the letter outlined why he believed Christianity was the most compelling way to live your life. And in his own simple way, he outlined, I believe because I want to believe. I want to believe in a world where when a child gets cancer, that's not the last word. I want to believe in a world when parents have to bury babies, that that's not the last world. And I'll never apologize for wanting to live in that kind of world. I need to believe. I believe, son, I believe something happened. The men and the women who followed Jesus after his death and resurrection had nothing to gain and everything to lose by saying Jesus had been raised from the dead. They didn't get a Bentley and a vacation home in their favorite beach destination. Their lives got harder. And then at the end of the letter, he wrote this in his own way. Son, I believe that Jesus was raised from the dead Because he said that's what would happen. That's a new level of faith for me. That's a Mary Magdalene, you got to get out of your head and into your heart view of, because I have this living relationship with Jesus, I trust him. And he said that death would be a semicolon, not a period. And I trust him. You ask me how I know he lives, the hymn goes. He lives within my heart. That's Christian mysticism. That's Mary Magdalene. Don't give me your doctrine and your sermons, preacher. Give me the real thing. Give me the living Christ. In my vocation, I end up doing a lot of weddings and funerals. If I'm ever given a choice, give me a funeral. Captive audience all day. A wedding's a whole different animal. But some of the most sacred moments in this church the last 15 years for me have been in this room for Christian funerals, often led by me or Pat Ward or Fletcher Shrigley, 
different women and men in this church will lead those. And it's always interesting because sometimes we do funerals, and I'm guilty of this, where we just make the person sound like the greatest person who's ever lived until the next person dies, and now they're the greatest person who ever lived, right? We kind of lie a little bit. Like, no one's that good. Nobody. And then every once in a while, we have a funeral in this room when someone tells the truth and preachers get so excited because we see it starting to happen, right? Oh, they're going to tell the truth. This person was complicated. This person drank a little too much. I love Jesus, but I drink a little bit. I'm reminded of the story of a minister who faced a remarkable dilemma. Their church was facing a significant debt crisis And there were two wealthy brothers in the church who wrote big checks every year to help the church meet their budget needs. And they were not well liked in the church. They were power hungry. They were manipulative. They were dismissive of women. They didn't treat people well. Frankly, no one really liked them and they couldn't figure out why they were still coming to church. The oldest brother dies. The youngest brother comes to the preacher the morning of the funeral. He writes him a check for half the money the church owes to the bank. And he says, if you speak about my brother as a saint, there's another check for an equal amount waiting for you in my car. So the preacher locked his office door, shut it behind him, sat at his desk and thought, I have the weirdest job. (laughs) And then he came up with an idea. And when it was his turn to speak at the funeral, he looked at the younger brother sitting on the front row. He looked at everyone who had gathered for this funeral. Most of the people there did not like this guy. And he said, we all know that brother so-and-so was a complicated person. He was deceitful. He was untrustworthy. And people are like, oh, he's about to spill the tea. I'm so glad I came to this funeral. And he said he was not trustworthy, he was mean, he was vindictive, he was a womanizer, but compared to his brother, he was a saint. (laughs) This is my Easter annual reminder to you and to me that you are not promised another Easter. Jesus' own brother said, you're not even promised tomorrow. He says, what is this life? You are but a vapor or a mist. It is the preacher's responsibility to remind some of us, this will be your last Easter. And you don't always know who it's going to be. And it's one of the heartbreaking parts of my job. But this will be the last Easter for some people in our church community. And you can choose at your funeral whether you want people to talk about your resume, your accomplishments, where you went to school, all the money you accumulated, all the trips that you went on, all the places you went, all the times you were in the Nashville socialite scenes. Or you can choose eulogy ethics, which is people talk about was she kind? Was she good? Did she love Jesus with her whole heart? And this is what I've learned 25 years in the game of doing funerals. That the people who walk the closest to Jesus have the biggest impact on the people who mourn their death. The closer that you get to Jesus, like Mary Magdalene, just wanting to be near the body of her friend, the closer that you walk with Jesus, when you sound like Jesus, when you talk like Jesus, when you treat people like Jesus, when you heal people like Jesus, when you include people like Jesus, those are the women and the men that leave a ripple effect behind them. And they live beyond one, two generations because they are aligned with the life of and the ministry of the most important human who's ever lived, the person who brought all of us together today. And his name is Jesus. So in this moment, for those of you who have never made a decision about Jesus, or it's been a long time since you've thought about him, and you've just been coasting through your life, the invitation is before you to consider the story that you are currently living by, your children watching you, and what you intend to do about it. As together we pray, the way our risen Lord taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing this last song together. for my faith.